Hi, I'm Mike Gerhauser. On behalf of the other elders and all who gather here, I want to say welcome to Resurgence Church. We are glad that you found us. Now, whether this is your first time joining us or you meet with us regularly, we pray that the message that you're about to hear would encourage you, would edify you in your faith, and would bring glory to God. We also want to encourage you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Don't forget to hit that bell so that you get notifications. And if you want to learn any more about us, you can go to our website at rsgchurch.com. There you can listen to past messages, you can give online, you can check our calendar of events, and you can see our statement of faith. Thank you again for joining us. Pray that you are blessed by the preaching of the Word this morning. God bless you. All right, well, we are getting into the Word for today, actually looking at the same verses that we were looking at last week. So if you were with us from last week, um, we're looking at 1 Timothy as we go through, verse by verse, through 1 Timothy um, chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. So if you would, as we do, would you stand with me as we read these verses again? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, it says this, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. You can take a seat. We are 1 Timothy 1, verses 18 to 20. And, and you'll see we did these verses last week, so this is a repeat of those same verses. Last week, we tackled most of those verses um, as we put them up. Matthew, you can even put them up there. But what it means to hold to faith, what it means to hold to a good conscience, uh, how, how depending on how we go on that, we could wage the good warfare or we can make shipwreck of the faith, right? And... Um, I couldn't get out of these verses that easily, though, because, because there's that verse at the end where it talks about handing them over to Satan. That's just too provocative a verse for me to, to leave it alone. Um, and so, as promised, we will be talking today about what Paul means when he says that he hands Hymenaeus and Alexander over to Satan, because I think you're just kind of reading along 1 Timothy, and that verse can kind of hit you sideways, right? You're like, whoa, hold on. Satan. Anytime Satan shows up, it, it kind of like stops me. I'm like, what's going on here? Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to just jump right into it. Now most scholars agree that what Paul's talking about when he talks about handing people over to Satan this isn't some like you know weird torture thing this is excommunication that he's talking about that he has put these two men outside of the church basically saying you're you're no longer welcome to fellowship with us because of the unorthodox they're not willing to subscribe to the orthodoxy of the apostolic teaching of the Christian doctrine, okay? So he has put them out of the church. Now, it's unclear whether these men were leaders in the church. There is some reason to believe that they were because Paul mentions them by name. Uh, he also mentions a specific teaching that Hymenaeus is holding to when uh, in 2 Timothy. And so it's possible that he was in a position to teach since he was holding some... Um, some wrong doctrine. And there in Paul's second letter to Timothy, Paul mentions Hymenaeus, this time along with a guy named Philetus. And he says that they have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. And he says, and they are upsetting the faith of some. So we've got these guys, Philetus, Hymenaeus, Alexander. We've got several guys here that are upsetting the faith of some of the people in the fellowship, presumably causing division which is a major issue when you go back. I mean, how often does Christ talk about unity, right? How often does Christ talk about loving one another? And in the early church, we see it, you know, so many times people are like, oh, I want to be like the first century church. And I'm like, yeah, well, they had their problems, all right? Look at the church of Corinth. Look at even in Acts, you know, when, when people are, the, the widows are arguing, oh, they're not, we're not getting fed. And, and so there, were, there was division threatening the church early on. And it makes sense why. I mean, the, the enemy wants to tear apart what God has brought together. And, and so they're upsetting the, the faith and causing division in the church. We can assume that they've been confronted about it, um, and they've persisted in either teaching what they're teaching or believing in what they're believing. As for Alexander, if we look at Alexander, so we do see Hymenaeus again. We see him in 1 Timothy. We see him in 2 Timothy. Alexander, not so sure, because we do get a mention of a guy named Alexander the coppersmith in 2 Timothy. Uh, don't know if it's exactly the same Alexander. It was a common name. Possible it's the same guy. And here Paul says that the, um, 
he had done him great harm, that Alexander the coppersmith did great harm to Paul and to his ministry. He says, the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. And he even warns Timothy, he says, beware of him uh, because he strongly opposed our message. So again, we're not sure if that's the same Alexander. We're pretty sure that's the same Hymenaeus. Um, but it, it gives us some sense that there were men in this congregation in the church of Ephesus, which is where we are, uh, who needed some correction, okay? Either because they were pushing false doctrine or because they were causing some disunity in the fellowship. And as we're going to see today, we're going to be talking about correction. We're going to be talking about church discipline, uh, not something we often talk about, but it's here in the scripture as we go through. That's why I love going through the Bible kind of verse by verse, because you'll touch everything. Everything that affects the church, you're going to touch on it because it's there in the scripture. And so we're going to be talking about church discipline. And, and I want to emphasize that when we talk about church discipline, I, our culture, our, our time is really, I don't know that this happens the same way that it used to happen. Um, I think in part, even when you look at church membership and you look at the way people feel connected to the church, you go back hundreds of years and it was the church. That was a, a community institution. And if you were put out of the church, you were out of the church. Nowadays, it's like, yeah, you put me out of the church, I'll go to the 10 churches down the street, you know? And so there's a different accountability. Uh, there's, a, there's more of a, a likelihood that people are going to just take offense and take off, or, or they're, they're not going to yield themselves or submit themselves to church discipline the same way. Um, but I hope that I'll show you today the, the beauty of it uh, and, and the goodness that's involved in it. And I want to point out that it's, it's not about hunting down the bad guys in church. Okay. This isn't like after today, we're going to be like, oh, you know, we're, we're like sin sleuths looking for somebody to, to pick out at this point. Um, you know, there may be times when we've got to kick the wolves out to protect the sheep. But when we are talking about those who confess Christ and have gone astray in something uh, and they need to be corrected. Church discipline, listen, church discipline really becomes about love. Okay. It's, it's a way to love the individual. It's a way uh, to love the church. It's a way to love the Lord. And I'll, I'll develop that a little bit more as we go. But this morning we'll talk about the how and the why of church discipline. But first we need to establish one thing. Uh, that we might not want to believe, but I, I hope I'll show it to you. I'll convince you in scripture here. So if you're taking notes, here's our first big point, all right? Taking notes, write this down. This three words. Discipline is good, okay? Discipline is good. And we have to, we have to learn that, I think, because it doesn't feel that way, right? It often doesn't feel that way. Our flesh tells us that discipline is bad. Think back to when you were a kid, you know, and what lengths you would go to so you wouldn't get in trouble. Remember, like, I mean, how many times I hid under my bed or pretended to run away, packed an empty suitcase. Which, ironic, you can't really pack an empty suitcase. Packed an empty suitcase, and I was like, I'd open the window and hide under the bed, make my mom think I left, you know, and she never looked for me. She <laughs> never cared uh, that I was leaving. There's... In my mind, it was like hours I'm suffocating under the bed, but really it was probably like three minutes later. I'm like, don't you notice I'm gone? You know, she didn't. Um, maybe you just keep a low profile when dad comes home. Uh, I mean, do you remember the feeling of dread that filled the space of time between dad walking in the door and mom talking to him, right? Like that was, you, you're talking to dad, dad's like, hey, how was your day, bud? And you're like, good. And in your mind, you're like, I have moments to live. I only have moments to live. What would I do with my last moments on earth? Um, you know, I remember stuffing those little golden books down my pants when I knew a spanking was coming. Um, you know, the little hardcover story books. And I, it was a futile endeavor because if my suddenly square bottom didn't give me away, um, one smack with a wooden spoon certainly tipped my mother off that there was something going on there. But there is, there is something very natural about wanting to avoid, about wanting to avoid pain, right? Not just physical pain, um, but, but even that, that stern rebuke, even the look of disappointment in, in your mother or your father's eyes, you know, um, even when you know that you deserve it and you know it's coming and you know it's rightfully coming, there's still something in us that wants to avoid it. In the very beginning, Carl said it all started in the garden and it did all start in the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, their, their default response was to hide, right? Where God walks in, he says, where are you? And they're hiding. Why were they hiding? Because of shame, because of guilt. 
But we need to know, listen, we need to know that discipline, as unpleasant as it might feel, it is good. All right. Even in sending Adam and Eve out, there was discipline there. And God sends them out of the garden. God's discipline in that case, that was mercy. That was a merciful discipline. Genesis 3, 22 and 23 says, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Dot, dot, dot. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. Now, what would have happened if God had left them in the garden and they had reached out their hand and taken of the tree of life and eaten and lived forever? Listen, they would have lived forever in a fallen state. They would have lived in eternity in separation from God. But God demonstrates his love for us in first removing our sin, in removing our guilt and shame uh, before he gives us eternal life through Christ so that we can enter eternal life completely forgiven, completely free. Amen. Hebrews 12, if if you have your Bibles, you can flip there. I'll read a bit of a section here. This comes right after Hebrews 11, which we spent several months on, our, our faith chapter. Hebrews 12, after going through this whole chapter on faith, encouraging, encouraging, look at this example of faith, this example of faith, this example of faith, and you can do it too, the writer is saying. Now we get to verse 5 of Hebrews 12. And again, my my point is this is in the context of encouragement, okay? In the context of actually encouragement. You say, well, that doesn't sound so encouraging. But he says, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son." Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Verse 8. If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. Amen. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Love that. Discipline yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, and it is a tool that trains us. A tool that trains us. And it is proof, furthermore, it is proof, if we're being disciplined, that we are loved by God and are his sons. Now listen, I could have just said we are his children there. But I, I, I want to point out that Scripture specifically says sons. There are other verses that use a, a gender-neutral word, uh, technon, in the Greek, like in John 1.12, where it says, all who believe in Jesus are given the right to be called children of God, properly translated as children. But here it uses that Greek word huios, which is usually specific to a male child. And I, and I point that out because there is a cultural significance to this. I think James has said it before uh, so beautifully, that, that it's a special place of honor in the eyes of the Father, loved and cherished as a son. So ladies, I'm sorry if that's uncomfortable. You have to think of yourselves as sons, but I've got to think of myself as a bride. So uh, there's something, all of us have something to work through there, right? But if we are sons, then we know that the Lord will discipline us, and we know that it is for our good. Amen. You know, as I was preparing this, I was, I, was, I was thinking, I'm like, all right, discipline. It's unpleasant. Is every unpleasant thing that happens to us discipline? And uh, do we need discernment to, to distinguish between discipline and misfortune? I'm kind of working my way through, and, and I, I kind of came to the conclusion that a lot more of it is discipline than I would have at first said. I would have said, oh, we need discernment. And some, hey, look, you wake up in the middle of the night, and you're kind of stumbling through the bedroom, and you stub your toe. That hurts. That's painful. Is that discipline from the Lord? I don't think so, right? Maybe you could take a spiritual truth about walking in the light, walking in the dark, huh? Okay, maybe that's going too far. Uh, but, but in many cases, um, discipline is from the Lord. The unpleasant experiences that we have are discipline from the Lord. Now, um, there are things 
that in our understanding of God's sovereignty, you know, when we think about the Lord disciplining us, sometimes we could think about like an active discipline, God inflicting something upon us. And it's not always that way. Because there are natural consequences to our sin that God will allow, and it is his permissive will, and he will use those things to train us. So, for example, you have a habit of lying, and you get caught in a lie. Well, that's uncomfortable, right? That's unpleasant, and it can cause a lot of, a lot of fallout from that, okay? Now, did God punish you? Did he discipline you? Well, he allowed the natural consequences of your sin so that you can learn something from it. And so we can look at many of the things that happen to us that are unpleasant and understand that they are discipline allowed from the Lord in order to train us toward righteousness. How many times do we have to do something that's uncomfortable and uncomfortable and uncomfortable and uncomfortable, and then we say, you know, I should stop doing that, right? So any of these things that draw us away from righteousness and they're uncomfortable, the Lord is saying, come on back, come on back. And he trains us. You know, when you think about, I've got an apple tree right now. We had the apple trees close to the fence and they weren't getting direct sunlight. And so they got all wonky. And I moved them last summer uh, more to the center of the yard. And one apple tree is like this. I mean, it's just wah, that way. And I, it was actually facing that way. I was trying to get to the sun. I flipped it the other way, hoping it would correct itself, but it's not. And so I've had to tie uh, posts, poles to it. All right. And I'm training it. It's a slow process. Okay, and you train the tree. That's how they get all these decorative and ornate that's slow. As it grows, you give it the direction it should go, and then it is trained. Amen? And the same goes for us in our spiritual walks. You know, it is, a, um, it is a mercy of God. Let me say this. It is a mercy of God when he exposes our sin. And when he allows us to feel the natural consequences of our sin, it is a mercy of God because things, listen, things have to be brought to the light before they could be dealt with, right? Nobody's ever gone in for surgery and the surgeon scrubs up and washes his hands and walks in and then turns off the lights, right? I would be very nervous if that happened. I'm going in with night vision. Um, nobody does that. Sin, listen, sin is a cancer, that needs to be exposed before it can be cut out. And it is a mercy of God when he exposes it, amen? So that's our first point. Discipline is ultimately good, okay? And we, that's, our, that's our groundwork. Now, specifically, I wanna talk about church discipline this morning, how it functions in the local body, uh, see what it looks like carried out. So we're gonna look at two aspects. I said, we'll look at the process, and we'll look at the purpose. So first, the process. If you're taking notes again, process, all right? What does church discipline look like? How is it carried out? In the verses that we're looking at this morning in 1 Timothy, Paul says that he hands these men over to Satan, but he doesn't give us a whole lot more than that. There is a little bit more we'll touch on when we talk about purpose. But to fill us in a little bit, I want to go to Matthew chapter 18. Again, if you have your Bibles, you can flip there, because I'll be reading a longer section. Matthew chapter 18. If you don't have a Bible, we have some Bibles in the back. If you don't have a Bible at all, you're welcome to take one of those home with you. But Matthew chapter 18. And I'm going to be picking up at verse 15. We'll be reading verses 15 to 20. This is Jesus speaking in Matthew 18, starting at verse 15. He says this, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among you. And some of those verses sound very familiar. Um, this outlines the basic process that we use for church discipline. But we're going to go over that specifically in just a minute. But um, I just want to point out a few things on those final verses because they're, they're often misapplied, that two or three are gathered, I'm there in your midst, um, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And, and we see these, these uh, scriptures being used from, from things all the way from like spiritual war, warfare to, to naming it and claiming it, uh, to prayer, you know, in two or three are gathered. And, and I, just, I just want to comment on those real quick. As for binding and loosing, 
the point being made here uh, is that when we confront sin in a brother or sister, we are binding and loosing what was already bound or loosed in heaven. Many of your Bibles will have a footnote uh, that offers a slightly different rendering of those of that in the Greek. It says, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. In other words, when we make judgments, this is in the context of, of judgment, of, of uh, church discipline. When we make judgments according to God's word regarding sin, we are agreeing with a judgment that has already been made in heaven. Does that make sense? And as far as um, the two or three being gathered, again, people often apply this to prayer, uh, but the immediate context is in church discipline. You know, we need to understand that Jesus is using language, first of all, that would be very familiar to the Jews when he says two or three, okay? Uh, it comes right out of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 17, 6 says, on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Deuteronomy 19, 15, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. So he's using this language that has to do with judgment, with, with discerning uh, right and wrong and, 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 and sin. Jesus is talking about two or three being gathered as witnesses. And he says in that instance that he is there in their midst, meaning that Jesus Christ is spiritually present with us in, the, in that discipline, in that discernment, in that judgment of is this sin or is this not sin? Does that make sense? So he is there present with us when we confront sin. And so we have a model for reconciliation within the church body that Jesus affirms that it is in alignment with the heart of God. And here's what that process looks like, according to Matthew 18, all right? There are four stages to it. First, if someone is in sin, you go to them privately and you address it. You do not call up your 15 closest friends and tell them first and say, did you notice that too? Because I noticed this thing. You don't, you don't post some thinly veiled, you know, things on social media and hope that they'll get the message. That is not the way that scripture tells us to address it. You go to them privately, you tell them their fault or the offense. There's two ways they can go. If they repent, well, hey, scripture says you have gained your brother. That is awesome. That is worthy of rejoicing. Mission accomplished. The process stops there. All right, that's the end of church discipline. They have repented. But if a brother refuses to repent or claims that there is no offense, then the next step is to bring witnesses. And it makes sense that you would bring witnesses. These witnesses serve two purposes, really, okay? First, they establish the truth of the accusation. I say, hey, well, let's say I'm bringing an accusation. Now the witnesses say, yeah, this is really happening, okay? It's not just me being like somebody walked past me with their earbuds in and I said, hello, they didn't say hello back to me and I'm offended. And they say, oh, well, you know, it straightens that out. Okay. It establishes what happened. And the second purpose of the witnesses is to determine if there is actually sin. Okay. It's, it's not always sin necessarily. Uh, if it is sin and it has been established that it is true, then the brother in sin is now encouraged to repent. And now he feels the weight of multiple witnesses saying, yes, you should, you should repent. And if he does now seeing that others say, yeah, this is sin and you need to repent, then the process stops there. You have gained your brother and we rejoice. But if he again refuses to repent, then it goes on to stage three, which scripture says is to bring it before the church. This is where it really gets uncomfortable, all right? To bring somebody before the church and to announce to the church the sin. By that point, often somebody takes off, unfortunately. I, I pray that they don't. I think, I hope, I hope we get to a point where we don't. We say, you know, and the purpose of that is not gossip. It's not to put them in the stocks and shame them up here. The purpose of that is so that there are many people now collectively as a community holding this person accountable and encouraging them to repent, okay? To come back, okay? To, uh, to get out of whatever wayward uh, thing they are in. It is not to gossip, but it is to expose the whole church so that the body can come alongside this individual and urge them to repent. Now, the church 
has a part in this. The church collectively cannot pretend that nothing has happened at that point. Something has been declared. We can't just go on with business as usual and, and pretend like it hasn't happened and keep having that same relationship that we had with that individual. Uh, I know it's awkward, but the, the whole body plays a part in this, and we are collectively called to encourage that person to repent. If he does, the process stops there, okay? And we have gained a brother, and we rejoice, and we forgive, and we welcome back. But if he still refuses to repent, then we go to stage four. Jesus says, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, he is to be treated as an unbeliever. Now, that's the stage that Paul's at here in 1 Timothy when he says he turns him over to Satan. He, he has essentially excommunicated Hymenaeus and Alexander. And, and one quick point I want to make before we, we move on to the next part. You are to treat them as an unbeliever. Well, how do we treat unbelievers? Okay, this is an important point. Like a Gentile or a tax collector, it doesn't mean that we take them out to the parking lot and throw rocks at them. Right? That's not that's not the way we treat unbelievers. Uh, it, it's not. It doesn't mean that we say nasty things about them on social media. Um, it, it means that they are no longer considered a brother or a sister in Christ. They can no longer enjoy the community of the church. They can no longer enjoy the fellowship of the body. They no longer participate in communion. You don't take them into your confidence, maybe the way you would another brother or sister in Christ. You you don't seek their counsel the way that you would another brother or sister in Christ. Listen, by the way, if you have friends and you seek their counsel and they're not Christians, that's a bad idea, right? Because they're playing by a whole different set of rules. But you deal with them kindly. You evangelize to them. You speak of the goodness of God. You speak of the forgiveness that is in Christ. Um, you, you, you share the love of Christ with them just as you would with any other unbeliever. Now, Paul says, some of you say, well, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says we're not even supposed to eat with such a person. And we'll be looking at that scripture. Now, I'm, I'm personally, you could, I guess this is debatable. I'm of the opinion that Paul specifically has communion in mind when he's talking about that. But it could be, it could be broader. He, either way, he's emphasizing a shift that happens in the relationship when he says that. That, that uh, he's talking about the level of intimacy that you no longer have in sharing bread or sharing a meal with this individual. Um, there is a point at this point, at the fourth stage of excommunication, this is a, a point of a fundamental shift in relationship, okay? Um, but it's not necessarily a complete shunning either, um, where, you know, you see them in the supermarket and you're like, oh, and you got to walk by like you don't even see them or don't even know them. It's, it's not a complete shunning. Um, at this point, though, we are to deal with them as we would an unbeliever. And so those are the four stages that we see outlined in Scripture that would be church discipline. It's not, you know, that being said, we can't just do it coldly where it's, it's a mechanical process. There, there's a lot of prayer involved in it, a lot of counsel involved in it. But those are the four stages. Um, those first two steps, they could be carried out by anybody. A brother go to a brother, you know, an elder can come to a brother. A brother can come to an elder, okay? We'll talk more about that uh, as it gets into, I think it's chapter four or five, where he talks about charges being brought against an elder. Um, but obviously, by the time you get to stage three or four, the whole church is involved at this point, and the leadership of the church is necessarily involved in it. And, and specifically and uniquely, I'll say this, the leadership of the church is given a certain authority, you know, we don't lord it over you. And we see the way that Jesus tells those who will lead how they are to lead, that they are to be servants, that they're to be the least among you. Uh, but but it, there is a certain authority in regards to two things that the leadership of the church has been, has been given, and it is doctrine and discipline. Right? That we are called and held to account um, to maintain the purity of the doctrine and to maintain the holiness of the church through discipline. And so let's look second, as I said, the purpose. So that's the process of church discipline, the purpose of discipline. And we've seen it a bit already. We've mentioned it already. And even in our verse from 1 Timothy, but write this down. The purpose is at every step, every step along the way, the purpose is about restoration and reconciliation. Every step of the way. The goal in Matthew 18 is to regain your brother. Right In 1 Timothy, Paul says he hands these men over to Satan. Now, that sounds terrifying, but it's not to be punished 
or to be tortured for their insolence, right? Uh, it, it is to be instructed so that they may learn not to blaspheme, so that they might learn through unpleasant consequences what joys there are in obedience and holiness. Amen? Remember, we said that discipline is good, and it's a way to show love. It shows love first to the individual that is in sin by pointing out sin and bringing them to repentance. That is loving the individual because you are bringing them back into alignment with the will of God and all the blessings and mercies that we experience in the will of God. Amen. It shows love to the congregation also. It shows love to the whole church. Uh, and it does this by, by seeking to preserve the holiness uh, and the unity of the body. And it prevents others from being led astray. You might see somebody doing something and you say, well, they can do that. Maybe, maybe you don't know exactly what's going on with them. Or maybe you've heard something. It, it, maybe it's just a rumor, but it can lead others into sin. And so there is a love for the congregation in that. If there was a cancer in your body, you would seek to heal it, right? We would seek to heal it. And if it cannot be healed, you would cut it out. Now, listen, I'm not calling people cancer, okay? I'm not saying this person is a cancer to our church, but sin is a cancer, okay? And it needs to be addressed for the health of the whole body. And just like in the natural, if we can heal the body without cutting something off, we do that first, don't we? But if we have to cut something off in order to preserve the health of the whole body, we do that as well. And so the goal is always love. And finally, exercising discipline in the household of God, it shows love to God. It shows love for Christ because it recognizes his holiness. It takes seriously sin, which God hates. Amen. And so I want to look at an example. I'm going to wrap it up this morning with a few final thoughts here. We're going to look at an example in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Again, if you have your Bibles, I'm taking you all over the place. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read the whole chapter. It's a short chapter but the whole of chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians. It's actually the only other place in Scripture where Paul talks about handing someone over to Satan. So he says that twice, once in 1 Timothy and once here in 1 Corinthians 5. And it's a great example of seeing church discipline in action. And so I'm going to pick it up right there at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul addressing the church, he says this, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. We know leaven is yeast, okay, for those younger in here that don't know. And, and he talks about leaven or yeast being representative of sin, okay? That a little sin is going to leaven the whole lump. And he says, let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter. This is, um, this is called 1 Corinthians, but there was another letter that Paul had obviously written that he mentions here that we do not have any. It's no longer extant, so it's been lost. But he says, uh, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all, meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality, or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. 
that last line, purge the evil person from among you, that's repeated at least half a dozen times in Deuteronomy over and over. We see that, that you shall cleanse or purge the evil from among Israel. But we see several things happening right there in, in 1 Corinthians 5, right? First, there is an obvious and flagrant sexual immorality that has happened in this church, um, in the church, okay? It, Paul says it's a kind that's not even tolerated among the pagans. Now, listen, that is saying a lot in Corinth. Corinth was a city known for sexual immorality. It was known for its perversity. Uh, it, it became a, a word for sexual perversity. And so uh, he says it's not even tolerated among the pagans. So even in a city known for sexual immorality, this thing happening in the church is making some headlines. That's a scandal. You want to talk about church scandals. But there's actually, I will suggest that there is actually an encouragement in that. Okay. Because I would think in a situation like this, maybe if I was Paul, I would be like, you know what? I tried. Corinth didn't work out. You know, let's move on to Ephesus or Philippi or wherever else. All right. There's plenty of other churches I've planted. Corinth didn't take. But, um, oh, let me say this first. It's also just not one guy. There's not just one guy in this church who, who's running into something. It says the rest of the church ha obviously hasn't confronted him on it. In fact, that, that's probably why Paul skips those first several steps. And maybe they're not, they don't even have the discernment to even understand what he's doing is wrong because it says they're boasting about it. They're bragging about it. Okay. Then that's, listen, that's the sin of many churches today that they let sexual immorality happen in the church, even in the pulpit ordaining things that are sexually immoral, and they boast about it, claiming love, claiming tolerance. And I mentioned this list this last week. I stole it from a podcast. I thought it was so funny where he says, if you think tolerance is the same thing as love, he says, just go home and take your wife and look into her eyes and say, I tolerate you, right? It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. The church is never called to tolerate sin. In fact, we're called to the exact opposite. Amen. But here, here's the encouragement I said I'd get to. All right, in a situation like this where we would think Corinth is just, Corinth, it just didn't work out there. The church doesn't even have enough discernment to realize that this man's sin is a problem. Yet, Paul opens the letter this way. To the church of God that is in Corinth. To those sanctified, being made holy in Christ Jesus. He doesn't stop there. Called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. You know, as bad as things were in Corinth, they were being sanctified in Jesus Christ through faith. And that's, that's mind-blowing to me, but that's encouraging. That's encouraging to know. That, that's an, I mean, that's an understanding of grace that I don't know many of us have really gotten to understand grace that way. But listen, it does not mean that they can stay that way. They're called to be sanctified. They're called to grow in holiness. And so Paul brings correction. And he says that they should deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. But listen again for the purpose. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. The goal again and again and again is restoration. And because they love this man, the church is obedient to Paul. And they, they put him out of the assembly. They excommunicate him, okay? We know this, in this case, it's, it's very possible, I'll say that, that the man, it's effective and the man actually repents, okay? Uh, if we flip to 2 Corinthians 2, if you want, you could flip there. 2 Corinthians 2, starting at verse 6. Many scholars think that we're talking about the same man here. It's possible we're not. Either way, we're going to see the effects of effective church discipline here, okay? I'm of the mind that it's the same guy that uh, had his father's wife here. But if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, this is now the next letter, his follow-up letter to that first one, where he says, expel this guy. And obviously, they wrote back to him, okay, done, we got him, you know, um, this is what he says, starting at verse 6 of chapter 2. He says, For such a one, this punishment of the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. 
Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So he says, okay, that's enough. The man has repented. Welcome him back. Okay, whether it was that man or it was another man, whoever it was, it was someone that they had implemented this kind of discipline against, and now they are called to welcome him back. And we see the restoration that can come after discipline is administered. The church welcomes the person back in, reaffirms their love for him. And that is ultimately the goal of any church discipline is to restore a person to a position of obedience to Christ and unity within the fellowship of believers. Amen. There's actually, you know, as I was going through this, there's a lot more, I think, that we could say on the subject. There's some, some other great examples you could look at in scripture where discipline has been carried out. Um, I want to bring this in for a landing, though, with just a few final points, okay? First, this is not, as I said before, about being a bunch of sin sleuths, okay? Looking around, trying to dig up dirt on people, like, so that we could implement church discipline on them. That is not the heart of this, nor is it about a power trip on the part of the elders acting like overlords, and we're here to dish out punishments and, and hand out discipline to people. That is not the, the heart of it. Uh, in fact, actually, there's an interesting thing going on. One of the spots is in Third John, where he actually rebukes a man named Diotrephes, who was likely a person in authority. And, and this guy seems like he was on a power uh, trip and like excommunicating people uh, that, that just weren't agreeing with him or that were, that were crossing him. And John says, John says I'm going to deal with him when I get there. He has, some, he has some words for him. And so it is not about a power trip, but this process, again, is about love. Love for the individual, love for the church, love for God, and really even showing the world what love looks like. That we don't just say, hey, man, that's cool, whatever you like, you do you. No, but that we hold one another accountable because we know it's for their good. And now I will say that this process holds true for those in the congregation as well as those in leadership. Um, any brother can bring a concern to another brother. It doesn't have to come from the elders. At a certain point, as we said, if it persists, it will come to the elders. But all of us are called to hold one another accountable. And that is a blessing. And it is a grace. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. It's not loving to just leave someone in sin. But listen, as I said, this is for the leadership of the church too. In chapter five of, of First Timothy, we'll talk about that when we get there. But I want to mention also quickly that we belong to the EFCA. On the back of your bulletin, it says, member church of the EFCA. Some of you might be like, never noticed that before. I don't even know what that is. Uh, that's the Evangelical Free Church of America. We are an independent uh, church, resurgence church. Uh, but we belong to an association. It is not a denomination, but we belong to an association. We subscribe to the basic tenets of the, uh, of the statement of faith, and um, we come under certain auspices of the EFCA. And though we do maintain our autonomy as an independent church, the EFCA has what they call their board of ministerial standing. And their job is to determine the rules about credentialing, about ordaining ministers and credentialing ministers, and licensing ministers. But they also act on allegations of serious moral or doctrinal error. That's, that's part of their job of those who are their member churches. So if they found out, any, uh, for example, that there was a pastor or an elder in church involved in unrepentant sin, or teaching false doctrine, if it wasn't resolved first in-house, and I hope we would resolve it in-house, that they're able to investigate even, you know, what can they do? They can revoke credentialing. They can, they can basically say you're no longer part of the EFCA, but there is some accountability there even for us with our member association because everyone at every level is called to accountability. You know, we don't want to ever get to a place where like, what I say is the that's the end of the line. You know, that's how you get into cults. That's how you get into abuse, into these, these uh, situations where the, there's spiritual abuse happening. And if there is sin among us, we need to take it seriously. Now that said, I'll, I'll just add a quick point on when to practice discipline in the church. And the first rule, probably goes without saying, but the first big important rule is when there is sin. Okay, only when there is sin. There is a lot of things that might rankle us or might bother us about another person that are not necessarily sins. The Bible talks about freedom in Christ. Okay, there, there's different levels of comfort, different convictions that we have. 
as followers of Christ. There are maybe people at different stages in their sanctification. And so we don't just whip out church discipline because somebody took our parking spot or because, actually I have this in my notes, because a baby was making noise. It wasn't <laughs> in the service. That's not a time to, to whip out church discipline. Uh, but even when there is actual sin, it might still not be the time or the moment to for a formal initiation of church discipline because all sin is serious. Listen, I want you to understand all sin is serious. All sin put Christ on that cross. But the Bible also says that love covers over a multitude of sin. There is a time to overlook a sin. Okay, there is a time to, to bear with one another as we all live in this, in this flesh and we make mistakes and we repent and we grow. And so we're not talking about a one-off sin, okay? We're not talking about one-off sin and we're going to pounce on somebody and, and bring in church discipline. Even if we did, I think at that point, most of us would repent and say, you're right, I, I was wrong in that situation. And, and, the, and the process is over there. What we're talking about is a habitual and obvious sin that, that puts somebody outside the will of God or, or threatens the unity of the church. In the first epistle of John, he talks about those who make a practice of sinning. He says, no one who abides in Jesus keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. In verse 8 of chapter 3, he says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. But listen, that's the same letter where John also says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So here he's saying, nobody in God sins. But if we say we haven't sinned, we deceive ourselves. And he says, uh, the truth is not in us. So the key there, you say, well, how do you reconcile those? The key there is in that word practice, right? It is a practice of sinning. And that's what church discipline is really reserved for, for those who are in a habit of sinning, who have made a practice of sinning that threatens the holiness of their walk, threatens the holiness of the church. And ultimately, listen, what it does is it makes light of God's holiness, it makes light of Christ's sacrifice by treating Christ's death on the cross as an insignificant thing that's unworthy of our respect and gratitude. And finally, I'll close with this last point. I think I said that three times already, but I'm serious this time. Those verses, I'll just close with this observation, that those verses that we looked at in Matthew 18, all right, that, that lay out for us the process of church discipline, if you look at them in context, they come right after the parable of the lost sheep. And it comes right before the parable of the king who forgives the servant. Okay? It's all about rescue. It's all about rescue. It's about restoration and reconciliation. It's the heart of the father toward the prodigal son. It's the merciful king who forgives the debt of his servant. It's the, the shepherd that leaves the 99 to find the one who is lost. That's the heart of God that is present in the midst when a church confronts sin. Unfortunately, as I said, too often when a church initiates discipline, a person takes offense and leaves. And, uh, and we've seen that. That's, that's happened even here. Um, but we've also seen it happen beautifully. We've also, you know, when words are spoken by men, but the Holy Spirit brings conviction. We've also seen that there is repentance. We've seen repentance and reconciliation. Listen, I've experienced it in my own life on the receiving end, okay? And it, and it might not be pleasant in the moment, but when we have clear eyes, we see it as a mercy of God. We could see it for the loving grace that it is. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you that you have given us order, that you have given us a process, Lord, by which we are to expose sin, and it is for the purpose, not of punishment, but of restoration. Lord, we know there is a day when there is punishment for those who are outside of your grace. But Lord, I, I thank you for the restorative and, and, uh, and merciful discipline that you have called us to exercise. And I pray that we would yield ourselves and submit ourselves not only to, to that when it comes from a brother, but that we would yield ourselves and submit ourselves to the discipline that is from you as well, that we might learn, that we might be instructed, that we might learn uh, the goodness and the joy that comes in obedience and in being perfectly aligned with your will. I thank you for this body, Lord. I thank you that you have just done such a marvelous work in them. I praise you and thank you in Jesus' perfect name. Amen.